Switzerland is an idiosyncratic country in many ways, especially so when analysing the rise of the populist right. The SVP, the Swiss People's Party, is the biggest party in the country. No other country has witnessed such a success of a radical right party in Western Europe. The SVP has won more votes in the national elections than any other party ever in recent Swiss history. But why? Typically speaking, these parties have constructed and drawn from a common national identity or existing right-leaning subcultures to attract their support base. There is no extensive historically based right-leaning subculture in Switzerland though, unlike say Italy or Austria or France. Not only that, but Switzerland isn't a unified country in the sense that other Western nations understand. There are three recognised national languages and a fourth, Romanche. In total, Switzerland consists of four ethno-culturally separate regions. That makes for pinpointing a national identity difficult. Not only that, but politics is most pronounced on the cantonical level. Switzerland is separated into 26 cantons and politics tends to be isolated to each, thus favouring the local rather than the national. Federal politics is conducted as a loose confederation of canton branches that may have differing ideologies. This is important and will be referred back to when discussing the SVP. Populists have tended to galvanise support in response to supposed threats to national culture and solidarity. So how has this been possible in a divided country like Switzerland? Well, we do have two aspects of Swiss political culture that have been defining features of Swiss identity. The first being neutrality in international affairs. The Swiss have tended to be exceedingly sceptical of supranational political bodies and two, a constitutional, high-trust political system that has encouraged support of the citizenry through the use of referendums over political decision-making. The latter point is especially important in understanding the rise of populism. Populists, usually favouring majoritarianism, often favour referendums in political decision-making. The Front National, Hurt Wilders, Five Star Movement, UKIP, all have used or suggested the use of referendums for key political decisions. In Switzerland, this is literally built into the political system, meaning the public can dictate the salience of political issues a lot more so than in other countries, and smaller political parties can influence policy and issue visibility through the use of citizens' initiatives. If a group can amass 100,000 signatures, any issue will go to nationwide referendum, giving small parties the opportunity to make serious headway. Let's take National Action as an example. National Action were a small party in Switzerland formed in Zurich in 1961. Although the party were never electorally successful and were small in number, they were able to form popular citizens' initiatives that had considerable political impact. In 1969, they launched a referendum against over-foreignization that attempted to limit the proportion of foreign workers in Switzerland. The referendum, held in 1970, was able to get 46% approval with a voter turnout of over 70%. No mainstream party was pushing for such an action, but the high approval rating and voter turnout suggest that the demand was there for an anti-immigration political party. Throughout the 60s and 70s, numerous parties were formed that became associated, broadly speaking, as the movement against over-foreignization. And although able to enact referendums that had varying degrees of success, never had any electoral breakthroughs. Another party of note were the Swiss Automobilist Party, whose main purpose was to counter what they perceived to be extreme environmentalism. May seem odd, but Switzerland suffers from severe pollution from traffic congestion and has one of the highest automobiles to 1,000 citizen ratios in Europe. Throughout the 80s, as in many European countries, with the birth of numerous Green Party movements, a debate raged over climate change, the ozone layer and environmental pollution. The Automobilist Party was a reaction to that and initially a single-issue party. They soon branched out, however, and anti-immigration sentiment became crucial to their platform. In the 1991 federal elections, they were able to get over 5% of the vote. This was the best any nationalist-leaning party had done in Switzerland. Should also probably mention the Ticino League in the Italian-speaking canton of Ticino, formed in the early 1990s under the influence of Umberto Bossi's Lombardi League in Italy, which later became a national chapter of Lega Nord. Although successful in Ticino, this is a strictly regionalistic party and has little influence outside of this canton. So then, where were the SVP? Well, they'd been going for quite some time and had formal representation in the Federal Assembly consistently since 1951. Swiss politics has been atypical in Europe in that the Federal Council consisted of a so-called magic formula, a grand coalition of the most significant Swiss parties working together with none going into opposition. 
The consistent setup was Free Democratic Party, two members, Christian Democratic People's Party, two members, Social Democratic Party, two members, and Swiss People's Party, one member. This became known as Rule by Consensus. Things did change in 2003, but we will discuss that later. The SVP then were a staple of Swiss politics. Founded in 1936 as the Party of Farmers, Traders and Independents, the party was always against internationalism and sought protectionist policies for its constituents. In 1971, they became the SVP through merging with the Democratic Party. This was an attempt to broaden appeal and become a more left-leaning political outfit. This resulted in a strong reaction from other more conservative elements of the party and ultimately proved to be the kindling for the party we see today. As I mentioned before, national parties in Switzerland are a broad coalition of different party cantons. Each canton may have different ideological leanings than the others. Parties on the federal level are unable to interfere with the membership of parties on the canton level. So strong ideological ruptures can emerge. This is precisely what happened in the SVP. This is Christopher Blocker, one of the richest men in Switzerland thanks to his work as CEO of EMS Chemie, a chemical manufacturing company. In 1977, he came to oversee the Zurich section of the SVP, and with his leadership, the branch underwent significant reform and rightward drift. His organizational capability revitalized the Zurich section, and his bombastic and confrontational approach highlighted his difference from Swiss politics prior. One of his first moves was founding the Young SVP, a right-wing student organization, that sought to combat the proliferation of the 68ers and left-wing orthodoxy. This was done through training the youth in public speaking, eloquence and ideas, making them media savvy and presentable to the public. The Zurich branch grew exponentially and party organization became solidified, all of this preceding any electoral breakthrough. Blocker increased his public visibility through spearheading campaigns against Switzerland's involvement in international affairs. He co-founded the Action for an Independent and Neutral Switzerland, or AUNS, in 1986. The organization formed in response to a referendum on UN membership, which was rejected in no small part thanks to Blocker's campaigning under the organization. Since then, AUNS has launched and fought against numerous referendum campaigns, such as on joining the EU and abolishing the army. This sedimented Blocker's image in public consciousness as a man seeking to defend traditional Swiss values of neutrality and direct democracy. Two facets that have proved prime for populist mobilization in Switzerland. The launching of a referendum in 1992 against illegal immigration, which sought to massively restrict laws of asylum, also served to position the SVP as the premier anti-immigration outlet. This referendum garnered 46% support in 1996. Controversy erupted throughout Switzerland in the late 90s, forcing the country to reflect on its neutrality during the Second World War. The official narrative of the country had been that Switzerland was neutral and any complicity with the Nazi regime was born of necessity. This was challenged in light of the Berger Report in 1997, as it was suggested that Swiss banks had financed the Nazi regime in return for gold confiscated from Jews. In fact, 76% of Nazi gold transactions were reportedly through Swiss banks. Not only that, but it was alleged that Swiss banks still kept the funds of Jewish victims of the Holocaust who had placed their savings in Swiss accounts for safekeeping. In order to reclaim these funds, the banks required death certificates, despite the Nazis obviously not issuing certificates for every Jew that died during this period. In the end, the Swiss government agreed to a $1.25 billion compensation deal, but not without considerable public outrage. Many Swiss saw this as an attack on their national independence, as foreign governments and groups were meddling in their internal affairs with no right to do so. Critically questioning Swiss neutrality was seen as an affront to their identity as a nation, and the SVP under Blocker's lead forthrightly rejected any culpability. The SVP delivered the transcript of a speech given by Blocker to hundreds of thousands of Swiss homes, allowing the SVP to become perceived as the prime defenders of Swiss identity. Blocker himself was convicted in 1999 for anti-Semitic libel, for stating the following in 1996. They could blackmail banks, you can blackmail governments, you can blackmail national banks, you can force them to give in. I would like to see if they can blackmail an entire people at the ballot box. They have to get through the eye of this needle and I will do my utmost that we do not yield. The conviction did not matter though, the SVP continued to rise. One thing the Zurich SVP did under Blocker was rapidly expand its base. Prior to Blocker, the SVP had sections in just over half of Swiss cantons. Under Blocker's influence, the party eventually came to be active in all Swiss cantons, a process of expansion that took place throughout the 90s. Due to this occurring under the influence of Blocker, these cantons held similar right-leaning views. 
This increased party solidarity, limited defections and allowed the party to amass considerable electoral strength. By 2003, the party was the biggest in Switzerland and for the first time since its implementation, the magic formula of the Federal Council was broken. The Christian Democratic Party lost a seat and the SVP gained one, giving them two seats. Previously, the SVP seat had always been occupied by a more moderate SVP member of the Bern Wing, but now Blocker sat on the council, representing the more radical Zurich branch of the party. Come 2007, the SVP had increased its vote share again, maintaining its position as the most popular party in the country and furthermore, gaining more votes than any party in Swiss political history. However, this brought to the fore the tensions between the Bern Wing of the party and the other cantons under the influence of Blocker's Zurich branch. The Federal Council refused to re-elect Blocker, something unprecedented, and instead opted for Evelyn Widmer-Schlumpf of the moderate Bern-associated Graubünden branch. The SVP became the first party to enter opposition in modern Swiss history, ending decades of rule by consensus. The SVP put pressure on both SVP members to step down from the council and then pressured their local cantons to expel them when they refused. They didn't, and this resulted in a party split. The Conservative Democratic Party was formed, largely consisting of the more moderately minded, unsympathetic towards Blocker's vision for the party. The party has never gained substantial support and this didn't hit the SVP particularly hard. In the 2011 federal elections, the party did slightly worse but was still the most popular party and then in 2015 the SVP received its highest vote share ever of 29.4%. As for policy positions, the radical right throughout Europe has gone through a bit of a shift. The FPO, the PVV, the Front National all started with neoliberal economic policies but have shifted more towards welfare chauvinism. The SVP on the other hand is strongly in favour of small government and reduced spending, placing great emphasis on personal responsibility. That said, the bulk of policy is dedicated to foreign policy, immigration and law and order. Honestly, if it wasn't for the SVP, Switzerland would likely be part of the EU now. Regardless, in 2005, Switzerland did become part of the Schengen Zone, which grants freedom of movement and thus mass migration into Switzerland. The SVP, working with AUNS, opposed the move in a referendum, but narrowly lost by a few percentage points. In 2010, a referendum was approved that would deport foreign-born criminals. The referendum received 52% approval. The posters for the campaign featured white sheep kicking black sheep off the Swiss flag, a very racialized image that sparked some controversy. The year prior, the SVP successfully supported and won a referendum to ban the construction of minarets. More information on that can be found in my video on the burqa, linked in the top right corner. Both of these pieces of legislature increased tensions between Switzerland and the EU, although tensions were to rise further at the behest of the SVP. In 2014, the Swiss backed an SVP-led referendum that sought to put a cap on the amount of immigrants the country would accept. Now, this is obviously in stark contrast to the Schengen Agreement the country signed up for in 2005 and its implementation would basically require a departure. In Switzerland, all referendums are legally binding and the government is constitutionally obliged to follow up on any referendum affirmatively. This is not what happened. In December of 2016, the government finalised an agreement confirming a quota system would not be implemented. The EU refused to sacrifice free movement while still allowing Switzerland access to other EU bilateral agreements involving trade, scientific research and programmes for students. Instead, the government instituted a policy in which unemployed Swiss nationals would be given employment preference over EU nationals. A survey in May showed that the majority of the Swiss do want border controls, but they also want to maintain EU accords, an impossible middle ground the EU will be unlikely to cater for. In response, the SVP is currently preparing a new initiative to scrap EU bilateral agreements to provide the Swiss with the right to dictate their own border controls. The story of the SVP is especially pertinent in light of Brexit. Here is a country that is not a member of the EU, but has certain agreements that come at the cost of freedom of movement. The EU has been especially rigid on this issue and the Swiss are finding themselves in the impossible position of sacrificing national autonomy over bilateral agreements with an international organisation, something starkly against how the Swiss have positioned themselves as internationally neutral in the past. This contradiction has galvanised large segments of the population in support of the SVP, who are the largest party in the country by a considerable margin. 
Recently, Austria has also requested that the EU allow Austrians to give preferential treatment to unemployed Austrians over EU nationals. The centre-left Chancellor, Christian Kern, speaking in Wels, dominated by the FPO, clearly made this pledge to undercut FPO support. Most likely, this will be unsuccessful as the FPO continues to rise and establishment parties falter. Post-Brexit, the EU is in a tougher bargaining position as more and more countries ask for concessions. Certain central tenets of membership may come into question. Free movement being the most divisive of concerns.